Hi, everyone. So my name is Jenny Singbach and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm on NYSERDA's energy and climate equity team. And I've been helping uh, co-lead the work of developing the state's first extreme heat action plan along with our partners at Department of Environmental Conservation and also with Anna Brown. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome you to our webinar today um, where we will be talking about local solutions to addressing extreme heat. Um, so we've had two webinars to date. We've had the Extreme Heat Built Environment webinar and the Heat Health and Lo uh, Local Solutions webinar is now today. Um, and again, this webinar will be recorded and will be available on DEC's website for sharing widely with your networks. Um, and the, the really the goal of these webinars is to really share more information about um, all the different elements of mitigating extreme heat. Um, so we really do help, uh, we hope that these webinars are, are good information and are, are helpful to the work that we're all doing together. Um, and with that, I wanna introduce now our, our panel moderator today, Anna Brown. Um, so Anna Brown is on NYSERDA's innovation team and has a, a long background in doing climate resilience work. Um, so, with that, I will turn it over to Anna to kick us off. Thank you, Jenny. And everybody, my sound is working, it seems. Okay. Um, well, really glad to get to, to join this session before. I think this is, um, I think we're in for a treat today. This focus of the day is um, jumping into um, learning about local solutions from a, a number of leaders. Um, from across the state. Um, I'll just say I also use she, her pronouns. I forgot to mention that at the start. Um, I wanted to just kind of give us a little bit of a structure on how this webinar is gonna flow. And then um, most importantly, we'll then introduce the set of speakers um, and, and we'll get to, to dive right in. Um, so we're going to today in the next um, couple of hours hear a bunch of um, stories of success in addressing extreme heat and learn about different lessons from the implementation side. Um, what does it mean to actually try to put, uh, put knowledge into, um, into practice and implement um, solutions? We're gonna hear from uh, local community-led organizations and local governments from across the state. And speakers are gonna showcase solutions that have become um, outstanding models for how to address extreme heat from the planning um, and anticipating extreme heat to um, um, think in, in thinking about acute situations as well as kind of longer term ad adaptation and, and, and preparation for how we get communities ready. Um, so we're gonna walk through um, a set of presentations. Um, I will in a moment um, introduce all the speakers and then we'll go one by one um, having each speaker uh, talk about the work that they've been involved in. Um, in particular, really focusing in on um, building partnerships and coalitions to address extreme heat. I think um, those of us who've been in this space recognize this is, um, there's not any one actor that is situated to um, address all of the problems around extreme heat. There's really a need for building bridges and um, breaking down silos across um, sectors and scales and, um, and, and different actors. So I think we're gonna be hearing a little bit about that during um, our time today. Um, and hopefully this is going to give you some inspiration to draw from um, as you are all in different ways involved in um, work in your own communities. Um, and so, and, and there, this will hopefully give you some, some, maybe some new ideas or sort of new ways to think about application. Um, so each speaker will have about 15, will have actually 15 minutes, not about 15 minutes, and I'm going to work to keep folks on time. Um, and then after each speaker, uh, we will have about five minutes to just, uh, give space for clarifying questions. Um, but we will, and if you have a question as you're listening, feel free to jump, um, drop that into the chat. So um, that can be uh, logged and we can be passing those on to our panelists. After we've heard from everybody, uh, we will have time to uh, just have some questions and answers um, to the full set of panelists. Um, so. That's the flow for today. Um, again, if you have questions as we go, drop them into the chat. Uh, but let me give you a quick uh, 
introduction to who we're going to hear from today. And then before each speaker, I will give a little bit more of a, a, a bio for each um, individual. Um, so we have with us um, Brigitte, Brigitte Griswold from Groundwork Hudson Valley, Josh Wilson from Erie County, Julie Phillip from Monroe County, and then from the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center, we have Stacy Pettigrew and Scott Kellogg. Um, so really looking forward to, to jumping right in. Um, I'm going to give you um, first, um, I actually just want to double check that I think the first speaker is, uh, maybe did it switch, is it still um, Brigitte? Uh, Le Le Leo, apologies, or are we jumping to Josh? Uh, that should be um, uh, Bridget, uh, but uh, if you click to the next slide on the slide deck, we should see, uh, uh, yeah, Groundhog, Hudson Valley, okay. and Bridget. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Um, okay, so very, very uh, lucky to have um, Bridget Griswold here from Groundwork Hudson Valley. She's the executive director and oversees the organization's effort to create sustainable environmental change in Yonkers through community-based partnerships that promote equity, youth leadership, and economic opportunity. Prior to joining Groundwork, Brigitte was the Director of Youth Engagement Programs for the, for the Nature Conservancy, where she managed all education, volunteer, and employment programs for young people. Brigitte is a 2009 Fellow, for, uh, fellow of Green for All, a national organization dedicated to building an inclusive green economy, and a 2010 fellow of the Center for Whole Communities, which promotes stronger connections between people, land, and community. And her work has been recognized widely um, from the EPA to the National Park Service in Westchester County and City of Yonkers. Um, she's also received notable awards from the Conservation Fund, Disney Worldwide um, Conservation Fund, and the Edison Award honoring innovation and innovators. Um, I want to just uh, give an in, uh, it, turn, turn it over to Brigitte um, now. She just to mention one more thing. Um, she has obviously lots of uh, accolades. Um, Brigitte is a nonprofit Westchester board member and an advisory board member for West Half of Yonkers, and she has a Bachelor of Arts um, in Communication and English Literature from the University of South Carolina. So I will turn it over to you, Brigitte, for 15 minutes. Thanks, Anna, for your generous introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Bridget, and I'm really excited to share a little bit about the work we've been doing around climate resilience in Yonkers. Um, so I'll be talking about a program that we've been working on now for the past three years called uh, Climate Safe Yonkers. And um, you can jump to the next slide, please, Craig. So, as Anna said, we are an environmental justice organization. We're based out of the city of Yonkers, the third largest city in New York, according to the last census report. And we focus on three primary areas of work. Uh, youth leadership, primarily providing green jobs and uh, green infrastructure, as well as tree care and stewardship for Yonkers youth. Um, we do a lot of work around sustainability education and promoting public awareness and action around environmental sustainability. And then what I'll be talking about today is our work specifically around climate resilience. Next slide, please. So um, I don't need to tell this crowd, but uh, we know that in, the, in our state of New York, the impacts of climate change are hitting us really hard right now. Um, we're looking at extreme temperatures and extreme heat. And also next slide, please. Also, a lot more flooding, um, not just from coastal surges, but just from extreme rain events. And I should probably add a third slide in here, given where we are now um, to talk about air quality, but um, we'll be doing that a little later. Uh, hope everybody's feeling healthy and breathing okay right now. Next slide, please. So um, the Climate Safe Neighborhoods is a national partnership. There are 16 groundwork organizations across the country that are focused on this type of work. And it really can, can, um, contains four main primary components. We are looking to map extreme heat and flooding across our cities. Um, and then also look at why certain places are hotter than others and certain places are more flood prone than others and understand those historical reasons. 
And then, of course, identifying which communities are most vulnerable to extreme heat and promoting local strategies to address those issues. Next slide, please. So we started out with uh, doing a, a bunch of GIS mapping. So this is the city of Yonkers. A couple things to note about Yonkers. It is at the convergence of three major rivers, and it also is the second hilliest city in the nation next to San Francisco. So that creates a lot of challenges related to flooding, um, but also related to heat. Next slide, please. So what we did was we took the model that was established by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to create a heat vulnerability index where we looked at things like land surface temperature. We looked at sensitivity issues like the percentage of impervious surface around our city, as well as the lack of tree canopy and where that was occurring. And then, of course, we looked at uh, percent household in poverty. And the reason why we looked at percent household in poverty is because if you are a low or moderate income family, um, you may not be able to uh, adjust to these extreme weather events um, in the sense that you might have not have a car. So you won't be able to drive out to the Berkshires to get some relief from extreme heat. You may also not be able to afford things like higher air conditioning and energy bills. Next slide, please. So this is the heat map of Yonkers, um, and um, right now, just looking at this map, it looks like heat is fairly evenly distributed across the city. Um, but when you start looking at other factors, it really helped us narrow where we needed to focus our interventions. Next slide, please. This is the percentage of um, impervious surface. So think about things like asphalt, rooftops roads, um, sidewalks, things that don't, um, that actually increase the impacts of urban heat island effect. Next slide, please. Absolutely mirror image of that is the percentage of tree canopy. So you can see that where there is a lot of impervious surface, there's not a lot of tree canopy. And that's important because trees can reduce heat um, by up to 10 to 20% in certain areas where urban heat islands are impacting our communities. Next slide, please. And this is percent household in poverty. So you see a concentration of low income residents in the southwest area of our city. Next slide, please. When you combine all those factors, we come up with what is um, the heat vulnerability index for the city of Yonkers. And um, that now um, really focuses our attention in the southwest area of our city. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick visual comparison. I was always struck by these images when uh, they came back from the GIS folks because it really is a mirror image of tree canopy, impervious surface, and extreme heat. Next slide, please. Then we did something really interesting where we looked at redlining and the history of redlining in the city of Yonkers. Um, redlining was a racist housing um, policy that was implemented by the federal government uh, back in the day. It was um, made an illegal practice in the 60s, but there wasn't a whole lot of equal and opposite action to undo those inequitable housing practices. And we may wonder what housing and racist housing practice has to do with climate change. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. So we took the old um, homeowner lending corporation map, and there's a really great website if y'all are interested in looking at your individual city and how redlining uh, was done in your city, um, it, done out of the University of Richmond. It's a site called Mapping Inequality, and you can actually pull up the old redlining maps. So what our GIS folks did was basically digitize that map so we could look at it against our um, our extreme heat data. Next slide, please. And what we found was um, there was a direct correlation between historically redlined and yellow lined areas and extreme heat in our city. Next slide, please. So these this really helped us to focus in, in the area of Southwest Yonkers and specifically the neighborhoods of Old 7th Ward, Getty Square, and Radford. Next slide, please. So it's all is really gloom and doomy. Um, and then 
we embarked then on a public education campaign and we assembled what we called the Climate Safe Yonkers Task Force. And this was comprised of residents who are living and breathing in these urban heat islands. So it was community activists, local other local nonprofits, uh, government elected officials were also advisors on this. And essentially what we what we tasked these folks to do um, was help us to really understand the nuances of vulnerability vulnerability in these hyper local contexts. And then um, also help folks understand the impacts of urban heat island and, and how it has ongoing repercussions that are multiplier effects that impacting public health, impacting things like education, um, impacting a number of other things besides just our immediate environment. Um, so those folks ended up being a very powerful force for change in our community. And um, we were really excited. We had about 30 people that were assembled representing business, representing um, local communities, and also um, residents of municipal and affordable housing. About 30 people, we paid all of them a stipend um, to participate. And the reason why we did that is because their local knowledge is valuable. Um, and many of them um, needed to be compensated for their time and their um, and their contributions. Next slide, please. So the goal of the task force was really to um, educate residents about these issues and also help advocate for change. What was really cool about this was that simultaneously with this task force being created, the city of Yonkers decided it was going to launch its first ever climate action plan which I have an advanced copy of right here. And so the city was actually a wonderful partner with us because once they learned about this task force, they said, well, maybe we need to include local input and local knowledge into the final plan. Next slide, please. So here's just a quick little timeline on the issue. A lot of the first uh, uh, iterations of what we were doing was around education, understanding um, the causes and, and um, reasons behind urban heat island effect, and then also understanding different solutions that can be deployed, things like bioswales, tree canopy, painting rooftops white, those kinds of things. And then, of course, now we're moving into the action phase where the climate action plan has been completed. And next slide, please. The nice thing about the climate action plan is that it includes 38 of the recommendations that our community task force put forward to the city. And it also is very much, there's a whole section of the plan dedicated to equity and vulnerability analysis. So our data and analysis was actually incorporated in, into the plan and the city is now prioritizing interventions in the most vulnerable neighborhoods, which is pretty awesome, I think. Next slide, please. The other thing we did was kind of an unusual partnership was partnering up with municipal and affordable housing agencies. And this was a little bit odd for us in the beginning. People were kind of like, why is an environmental justice nonprofit partnering up with affordable housing? But if you actually look at where municipal and affordable housing is, you can see that the vast majority of municipal housing is located in urban heat islands. And these are massive property owners, and they also house a lot of low income um, and risk prone residents to urban heat island effect. Yonkers was um, actually the um, recipient of a double DSEG uh, federal lawsuit, where in the early 80s, um, the federal judge, together with the local NAACP, sued the city of Yonkers for, uh, for um, unfair housing and also unfair education. So basically required deseg desegregation. And this was a lot of the reason why this historical placement of municipal housing in these in these low income areas. Next slide, please. So partnering up with municipal housing was really exciting and we ended up doing a feasibility study starting with 10 of the largest municipal housing sites and then um, doing demonstration projects with our local youth. So building things like bioswales, tree canopy, 
uh, strategically placed at these locations. Um, and now we're actually in the process of measuring the impacts, like how much temperature is actually reduced, as well as how much flood mitigation um, we were successful at conducting. Next slide, please. Just some pictures of some bioswells in the making. Next slide, please. I just want to flag that it's a really exciting time to be doing this work, and it's fabulous that, um, that the state is actually doing this first ever heat action plan. There's also unprecedented amount of funding out there right now. So the Inflation Reduction Act just passed the New York State Bond Act, and this means a lot of money is going to come down the pipe for local cities and municipalities to implement some of these urban heat island mitigation strategies. So it's a once in a generation opportunity that I hope we can all capitalize and, and benefit from. Next slide, please. And I'll just close with a few lessons learned. Uh, one of the big things that um, this whole process, this whole three year process has resulted in is it just an awareness of how much relationships and partnerships matter. If we didn't have a good existing relationship with the municipal housing authority, um, we wouldn't be able to do these transformative projects on their, on their properties because we're not land landowners. So having those kind of strategic partnerships was really, really necessary. And then another big lesson learned was investing to get a return. So a lot of the New York State grants, the million dollars we raised for municipal housing to do these green infrastructure projects, we had to invest upfront in a feasibility study. That was money that came out of our own pocket. Um, so there are, there are some kind of hoops to jump through with some of this money, um, but investing upfront can really yield a return on investment. So I think we put about $20,000 into this feasibility plan ended up getting a million five from the state. Um, and then, of course, technical knowledge and expertise. We actually did invest in getting all of our staff certified in green infrastructure. There's a national certification now that's out there. And investing in that technical expertise has really positioned us to make a difference in the city of Yonkers. And then without overemphasizing this, the community engagement piece and, and building capacity of local leaders to advocate and be part of the change is so critically important. So now we have community members in our task force. One of them is running for city council on a climate change agenda. The other one is a local artist, and she's now incorporated redlining and climate change into all of our work and is doing gallery shows all over the city. And that is a huge influence and, um, and powerful strategy. And then finally, the systems change that came about, which is kind of coincidental that the city was doing this climate action plan uh, at the same time that we were building this community coalition. But to be able to come together and implement an entire plan for the whole of the city has much more impact than doing a project here or a project there. And that's my presentation, and I'll stop there. I hope I didn't go too long, Anna. That was, that was right on time. You're great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for pulling that together. I want to take a couple minutes. I haven't seen any questions come in, clarifying questions, but now would be a time. Oh, I guess, um, oh, if you could just men uh, mention the certifying organization. I think you were just referring to the technical assistance. That was one clarifying question. Uh, I think you, uh, there was a question there. You mentioned that I think in relation to technical assistance, that there was an organization that staff were certified under. And there was yes. a question if you could just share again the name of the organization. Certified. Yes, it, it actually was the Green Building Council Association. The, they started the certification and it passed hands to another agency that offers it, which I will Google and put in the chat. Sorry, it's escaping my my brain right now. That's great. I see some other questions coming in. I think we might hold them for uh, for discussion, but there's a, um, there's yeah. I'm just trying to see if there's any more clarifying questions before we move to our next speaker. I found it. I'm about to put it in the chat. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, and you can drop it into the. I think you can respond to everybody through the chat. If not. Um, we will get it to everybody through the chat one way or another. There you go. I just sent it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have us, if Craig, you could move on to the next 
slide. And we Sana. are. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really pleased to um, switch gears now, and we're going to hear from Josh Wilson, who is with the Erie County Climate Task Force. Josh is Erie County's first sustainability director and since 2016 has headed up a group within the Department of Environment and Planning focused on the county's actions to both mitigate and make the community more resilient to climate change and also efforts to assure that the county has a healthy watershed. During his tenure, the county developed its first internal operations climate action plan, conducted a climate vulnerability assessment, released its phase one watershed management plan, and implemented many climate actions, resulting in the county receiving New York State's highest level recognition in their climate smart communities and clean energy communities program. Currently, the team is finalizing the county's first community climate action plan, conducting the phase two watershed management plan, and beginning to work on a heat emergency plan. Prior to his work at the county, uh, Josh was an environmental consultant for 15 years, including work as lead verifier for the California Climate Action Registry, and he received his Bachelor of Arts from Earlham College in Chemistry and Biology. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Josh. Great, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for having me at this meeting. Um, it's, I feel like I'm in, in really uh, kind of a guest company. I wanna say, uh, just to start off, um, you know, Bridget Griswold's work and Groundwork Hudson Valley's work in in Yonkers um, is just really been just pretty amazing and is something that we're looking at. You know, I think they're a leader in our state. Um, my presentation today is going to be kind of about how we're setting up our trajectory to do some of the some of the really exciting things they're doing. So I think that this this present my presentation is really about how a, a large county um, kind of gets its arms around extreme heat and starts to bring it into its planning and, and get things off the ground. Um, and really in the context of working with community partners to make that possible. So just next slide, just a couple like kind of introductory slides, like why are we, why would Buffalo be talking about, you know, Erie County is the home of Buffalo, New York. Why would we be talking about extreme heat? This is, this, this slide is now a little old, um, but uh, you know, the red bars and the red states superimposed on, on the, in the nation, you may have seen this. But this is showing that you know Buffalo has never experienced a hundred Fahrenheit degree day. Though if we just continue on a, a business as usual scenario um, without mitigating climate pollution, you know we could see fourteen hundred degree days a year by the end of the century. So we're we're hopefully not going to be reaching those kinds of temperatures. But there's a lot of potential for extreme heat, and we're already starting to experience hints of that. If we're a community that hasn't seen this in the past and something that's coming at us really quickly. So next slide. This is also something you may have seen. This comes from the IPC's most recent uh, uh, assessment. And I, I kind of like this slide, even though it's not perfect. Um, you know, I think the colors lean a little more, too much to the red. But what I like about this slide when I'm talking to audiences is that it really shows how from 1900 to today, we've seen a lot of climate change already. We've seen a lot of temperature rise worldwide. But also, as we move to the end of our century, there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to reduce the worst impacts. And that's what these different bars on the right show. Next slide. And, you know, you can just really see that, you know, as we move towards, like, the lifetime of a child born today, we can really do a lot. But even under, you know, for, in, in, in this talk, talking about extreme heat, even under the best case scenarios, that lowest bar in, in temperatures, uh, you can see that um, we have a lot of heat happening and it's gonna affect places like Buffalo that are not used to it. Next slide, please. So the way we kind of move into this is we did a climate vulnerability assessment. Um, we were working with University at Buffalo, uh, Dr. Susan Clark, who I believe is on this, uh, is an attendee to this, um, was a, a university partner. We received a New York State Department of Environment, Con DC Department of Environmental Conservation grant through the Climate Smart Communities Program. And it allowed us to do, which is kind of, I think, a typical vulnerability assessment scheme, which we looked at what the hazards are, what the sensitivity is to climate change, what our capacity is to adapt. And that kind of 
all together becomes our vulnerability. Um, we did these as a series of reports. Next slide, please. And uh, what you what we see and is you can go on the next slide. What you can see is that um, you know as far as hazards, temperature, extreme temperature, extreme heat is a critical threat to us, both in terms of the frequency and duration and jurisdiction that we have control over and the impacts to our community. Um, also precipitation and extreme winds events. Um, just like Bridget was saying, precipitation is kind of something that, that we're seeing more and more of, really intense thunderstorms that have a lot of rain, but also events like we saw over this winter where we had, uh, you know, in Buffalo, we had a, a pretty impactful blizzard. Um, and then biological threats like invasive species and uh, uh, vector-borne disease and har harmful algal, algal blooms. So next slide. So looking a little more closely at sensitivity to heat, you know, this is kind of a, 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 our initial assessment of extreme heat. Um, and this is both looking at landscape and socioeconomic sensitivities. So it's kind of combined in this chart. Uh, I'm sorry about the low resolution, but what you see is that the dark purple areas are we, where we have a lot of sensitivity to heat. And unsurprisingly, these are areas that are um, in our urban core, they're in disadvantaged communities, they're in, they're in communities of color, um, they're in red line communities. And uh, these, these areas are also in areas where, um, you know, we, we're trying to focus other programs. So next slide. When we look at the adaptive capacity, um, this is, you know, this, this involved us talking to our various departments. And so this is, this is saying how can, ready is the county to respond, both in terms of preparation and mitigation and response to these different threats. And on temperature, you know, we found that there was, on extreme heat, we found that there was a lot of, a lot of vulnerability. In Buffalo, we're, we're ready for cold, we think. Right? I think this, the last winter proved us wrong in some ways, but you know, we have a lot of infrastructure and systems in place to help people when we have extreme cold and have winter storms. We are not ready for heat. Um, you know, we, we found that when we looked at our cooling centers, we really haven't worked through with our, our cooling centers or our libraries or what identifies our cooling centers. We don't have agreements in place to keep staffing after hours. We don't have um, backup power at those facilities. We don't have even just thresholds set up as to when we would call a heat emergency. We just really haven't done that legwork because we haven't experienced it much in the past. So it was pretty eye-opening, um, especially on stream, extreme heat versus even some of the other threats was that, wow, this is something where we have a lot of work to do. There's also some really good research about how cold weather communities have high mortality when there's heat. Um, there's a paper I could share if anybody's interested that was, that, that, that really talks about how hot weather communities, when they have cold, they have a lot of mortality. In cold weather communities, when there's heat, they have mortality. I guess it's not a surprise, but it's it's something that um, we need to be aware of is that we just don't have the behaviors, we don't have the housing um, that is ready for this. And I, I, another part of the about the sensitivity too is that you know the there, there's a, there's an economic aspect to this. Low and moderate income residents are very sensitive to energy costs. And so even when we have homes that have a window air conditioner, we find that there are uh, individuals who are just trying not to use it because they're trying to make sure they have money for food the next month. So looking at the issue of energy affordability and energy burden is something that really uh, was raised up in this, in this study. So next slide, please. So this kind of led us to the kind of the next phase, which is that we were we worked on a community climate action plan. I want to watch my time, um, and so we had in the past had done a internal operations climate action plan, but in 2019 we began we convened a climate task force to work on a community focus an equity focused community climate action plan, and so um, this was really taking. Uh, some of the work that was done in the climate vulnerability assessment and other work around mitigation and convening our community around it. So we, the task force itself had about 30 members that were experts, university uh, professors, but also utilities, um, our MPO, our transit authority, 
representatives from local government and also just community members who who wanted to take a part in this and then we worked with them over the course of several years to put together this plan so next slide so one of the aspects of it was it had a really big community focus um, we did a lot of community engagement as you saw kind of like the beginning of the way we talk about this is an equity focused climate action plan and that meant we, we really needed to get into the community and talk to folks so there were a couple ways we did that um, one was that we formed a climate ambassador program and we had a, a, a an intern and a staff who watched over that and we really tried to find folks who could be brokers into the community for us trusted brokers folks who were you know through their positions in churches or organizations could usher us into meetings and have us present and we did a lot of work uh, talking to people a lot of work at tabling we presented our plan at um, local government board meetings and uh, just about anywhere where, where someone would let us talk to them so next slide. And our plan itself, we really wove climate resiliency into it. So you see on the left are the three overarching work groups. We had 10 work groups overall. Um, and the climate resiliency work group really it had a couple of experts, including Dr. Clark and Dr. Rensler from Chris Rensler from uh, UB. And they made that that team made sure that resiliency was within all of these different chapters and, and goals and strategies. So next slide. So we had seven strategies, 20, seven goals, 28 strategies, 172 action items. And I think you would find that about a third of our action items are around resiliency and many of them touch on extreme heat. Uh, next slide. And the way these look, and this is just an example, I'm pulling from our nature-based solutions chapter. We have a strategy about increase and preserve tree canopy. And there are five specific actions underneath this and all around how we need to make sure we have a community that has trees because trees are protective to people in cooling and uh, and also protect mental health and offer other benefits. You know, we need to make sure we have corridors to green spaces that are tree people if, if they're walking through urban areas that have no trees, they can't get to the park to sit down and cool off, for example. So this issue of nature based solutions, is just one example. But through all of our climate action plan, we've, we really worked to make sure we were addressing resilience and extreme heat. Next slide, please. So the next steps, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this um, because I think it's really important what we're really working on next. Uh, you know, we're finalizing our climate action plan. We're, <laughs> we did this plan without any consultant support uh, and, we, and, and in some ways on a, on a, on a, on a, on a very limited budget. And uh, just as we were finishing it, um, EPA announced this uh, 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 carbon pollution grant opportunity for, for, for carbon pollution reduction. Um, so we're going to be able to do a, a Niagara and Erie County, a regional climate work, climate plan. And for that, we're going to be able to do some of the things we weren't able to do in the past, like uh, some of the quantification and some of the deeper dive into our community greenhouse gas inventory, make that better. Um, and help us with prioritizing and modeling uh, where we're going and, you know, help us with these 172 actions to identify which ones need to be prioritized more. But then also we are working on a couple of very specific things that, uh, you know, one is a heat emergency plan. Uh, next slide. And, you know, in a lot of ways we wanted this to, uh, we want to kind of follow our, our leaders, you know, like the work that Bridget's done. We want to look at how our disadvantaged communities, our vulnerable communities, um, where specifically the impacts are greatest, and then look at how we, as a county, can pivot our work to address this. You know, one of the things that to point out is that as a county, you know, counties, a lot of our role is health and human services and protective services, right? We're the, we're the, we're, we're the public health um, or entity for the community. We, if you had a room full of county workers, most of those would be people who work with vulnerable people on mental health issues, on poverty issues, on heating assistance, working with seniors, working with veterans. And so, whereas with mitigation, in some ways, it's a, we have to stretch ourselves to work on some of the mitigation issues of reducing carbon impacts. When it comes, and, and that's important for us to do, when it comes to working on climate vulnerability and extreme heat, this is more bread and butter for the county. 
This is more doing what we've always done, which is working to protect vulnerable people. So it's really important that we get sharp about this and we pivot our programs around this topic um, and, and really get oriented around extreme heat. So we're again working with, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll jump through the next slide, but we're working with um, Dr. Susan Clark on that study too, and we're just kicking it off um, right now, the heat emergency plan. And then the final thing I wanna point out is that we have a program called, the, called Eclipse, the Erie County Low Income Program for Sustainable Energy. And this addresses something that's super important with extreme heat, is that topic of energy affordability. So this is something where we're working on creating a community energy program. Um, part of it looks like we'll work with our home energy assistance program directly offering community solar to heap recipients, and then um, also working on community-wide programs, potentially using community choice aggregation to work to lower energy costs, especially for low and moderate income residents, so they can afford to turn on that air conditioner. Thank you. And yeah, I can take questions too, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, and that was completely right on time. Um, I didn't mean to startle you when I came on camera. I'm trying to give gentle cues. Um, That's all right. that was per I can talk long, so I need all the cues I can get. Perfect. Um, no, that was great and really great to hear, you know, two different uh, from very different parts of the, the state um, experience on how to design um, heat action work that is really also keeping people um, kind of at the center. That's really the goal. It's great to hear about um, your process. So thank you for that. Um, I have seen a couple comments come in asking for that paper that you referred to. I think uh, there is interest in the paper you referenced around um, high mortality among cold, um, kind of cold communities, um, cold weather communities. So if you do find that link um, now, please feel free to circulate it through the chat. And um, if that's something we need to send around uh, separately, we can do that too. Sure, sure. I can do that later. Like after this Q and A, I'll um, throw that in the chat. Great, and I'm seeing some great questions and just wanna see if there's any clarifying questions right now before we move along to the next set of speakers. And I'm not seeing any, so. Um, Do you want me to respond to Emily Mart's question in the chat? If you, yeah, if you wanna respond to things in the chat, that's great. Just, um, I know we won't have a huge amount of time at the end for all the questions, so absolutely use the chat for responses. Um, I think that's great. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, let's uh, move, move along and we have um, in this next presentation, we have the pleasure of hearing from two different speakers. Um, we're gonna hear from Stacey Pettigrew, who is the co-founder of the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center and an as, as a assistant professor in the Population Health Sciences Department at Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. An environmental ep epidemiologist, her research focuses on environmental justice. And I'll introduce both speakers um, and then you can take it away. But um, the second person who'll be part of this presentation is Scott Kellogg, who is the educational director at the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center. Um, in Albany, and he is also the chair of urban agriculture in Albany's sustainability advisory committee and teaches urban policy at SUNY Albany and environmental education at Bard College. So I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Everybody hear me okay? Great. So I'm going to tell you all a little bit about the Radix Center and the work that we are doing as it pertains to extreme heat and climate mitigation. So we are a nonprofit organization based in the South End of Albany, New York, creating an urban environmental education center, a demonstration site of sustainable tools and technologies that are designed to teach urban residents with a special focus on youth, how to have greater local access and control over essential resources such as food, water, waste management, energy production, with an emphasis on building systems that are simple and affordable, the goal of coming up with a model that's going to be transferable to cities throughout the country and the world. And, you know, one thing that's actually great about cities like Albany and Buffalo is that they share a lot of characteristics in common as they pertain to social, environmental, and economic issues. So if we come up with a model that's functioning well in one of these locations, there's a high rate of success in replicating it in other locations. Next slide, please. 
So we focus a lot on teaching ecological literacy to area youth with a special focus on young children and older children as well. You know, many times urban residents tend to be disconnected with how to grow food, where water comes from, how to compost, how to be producing energy, things that um, may be surrounding us in the near vicinity of the city. But again, if you don't have a car, those things aren't going to be necessarily accessible to you or be necessarily culturally welcoming spaces. So we think there's a value in having green space, ecological space, agricultural space integrated into high density urban areas where it's going to be accessible to a greater number of people. So we have educational programs with the Albany School District doing garden basic education in a number of elementary schools and currently having every kindergarten in the district coming to Radix for visits and tours of the systems that we have on site there, which include gardens and chickens and aquaponic systems and honeybees and ponds and agroforestry systems. So a lot to see and learn from there. Next slide, please. We also do a program for high school youth, a after school employment program where we have local students age 14 to 18 coming to Radix on weekdays after school from four to seven, helping out with the systems there, getting getting paid for their time and for their work, um, and also learning about local environmental justice issues to underscore the relevancy of that work to their own lives. That turns into a big five week summer program that we do where they get paid through the city summer youth employment program. And we run that concurrently with an AmeriCorps program that's just started. So having undergraduate age fellows working alongside of uh, high school youth and, and working as a team together to do a whole variety of work, everything from urban and gardening to composting to food redistribution to watering street trees to uh, again, advocating for environmental justice issues. Next slide. We do a lot of work around advocacy around the river. Albany was you know, constructed uh, along the Hudson River, which is the primary reason why humans have been living here for thousands of years is due to the relationship with the river. We've unfortunately cut off our access to it by building an interstate that runs parallel to it. Um, so a lot of our work involves reconnecting youth to the river and constructing what we call artificial floating wetlands that we have been able to do through support through the DC's Hudson River um, uh, education, sorry, Hudson River estuary program and constructing a solar powered boat to deploy what are basically floating islands with water plants on them that we deploy near combined sewer overflow pipes, which um, are deploying uh, or spilling raw sewage into the Hudson and it's going to happen with greater frequency as climate change advances and a warmer atmosphere contains more moisture will produce extreme rainfall. Next slide. We also additionally run a community composting initiative where we're intercepting food waste around the city, composting them, turning into soil and growing food for people, nutrient dense food for people in food desert food apartheid communities. Here we have a team of chickens and ducks who play a great role in reducing food scraps and again, integrating this into our educational programs. Next slide. So this is a table, it's similar to a lot of the other ones that the other presenters have shown today, but is specific to Albany, which um, it's a little difficult to see, but basically what we have are maps that if you see the one in the upper left is uh, historical redlining maps for the city of Albany and the ones below it pertain to temperature, to uh, tree uh, canopy density and to uh, the percentages of impervious cover. And what we see pretty much uh, across the board is informally redlined and yellow line neighborhoods. We have higher temperatures as much as 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit difference one way or the other, uh, proportionally far fewer tree canopy cover and a greater percentage of impervious cover. All of these, of course, which impact the health and well-being of uh, low income and uh, BIPOC communities in environmental justice communities such as the South End. Next slide. This one's me. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, a project that we are uh, launching this summer and we're looking, we have teamed up with the uh, Office of Sustainability with the uh, City of Albany, Jason West is the director, and um, Daniel Kirk Davidoff, he's a, a meteorologist and also on the Sustainability Advisory Committee. And um, so we are looking at the urban heat island effect and the impact of tree cover. 
and we were able to purchase um, a number of weather stations. And what we're looking to do, the, the south end is a, a formerly red line neighborhood. And um, so we'd like to see what, you know, we look at, when we look at these, the redlining maps that um, we have the link for that everybody can go check out for their own cities. There have been numerous studies that have been done in different cities looking, overlaying those with green space and green cover. And oftentimes what we find is, is a legacy of lack of green space and tree cover in these neighborhoods. So what we're looking to do is to measure differences in the urban heat island effect first in, in the south end neighborhood, um, but then also what are the um, influences of tree cover on that. And so, um, so we have three streets that we're choosing streets with low, medium, and high trees. And then um, we're going to be tracking temperatures over the summer and heat events. And then I would like to tie that into health-related outcomes as well to see if, if there are differences there. Um, and so, that is uh, where we're getting underway. The next slide. So I'd like to talk to you all about a program that we've been running since November of 2021, which is called the South End Biocultural Diversity Forest, where we are planting street trees at no cost to residents in the South End of Albany with a specific equity focus. As we've discussed earlier, there is a proportionally lower percentage of tree cover in formerly red line neighborhoods like the South End. And the city does have a tree planting program. It's an adopted tree program. And unfortunately, in under-resourced neighborhoods, even the 50% cost share that's required of that is going to result over time in fewer trees getting planted in those neighborhoods combined with antiquated policies and, and ideas that tree cover correlates to criminal activity. Of course, the inverse of that has been proven to be the case. Um, and the combined effects of systemic disinvestment in formerly red line neighborhoods has resulted in there being far fewer trees in these neighborhoods. So we're a couple of things that are, are unique about our program. We're integrating our youth into the process of planting the trees. You see a photo here of them on the planting days, which we have in both the fall and the spring, getting trees in the ground and teaching them about the importance of trees and the role that they play in climate justice, really foregrounding their, their services in, in, in terms of producing shade and reduced temperatures and in air purification as well. We're also planting trees that are genetically unique because we really want to, to create greater diversity in the genetic makeup of, of our urban forest. As many urban forests consist of primarily trees that have been propagated through cloning methods and have no genetic diversity. So it's very important for us to plant trees that have been grown for seed. Um, they're mostly native. And in addition to all the benefits that trees provide in terms of shading, air purification, water infiltration, carbon sequestration, habitat creation, they also produce food. So we are practicing what we call urban agroforestry and planting a great number of edible fruit and nut producing trees, including apples and pears, persimmons, pawpaws, pecans, filberts, hay, um, hickories, a whole variety of trees that are going to be providing food for people in food insecure neighborhoods. And historically, municipalities have not been in favor of planting edible trees because the concern is, well, that they create a mess. Uh, my response to that simply is that hunger and food insecurity is also a mess. And in a neighborhood where the need for food is great, that's likely not going to be a problem. Next slide, please. So, yep, here's more planting going on. Um, in neighborhoods, we uh, do typically the planting in the spring and the fall when we can get bare root trees shipped to us at a, a greatly reduced uh, shipping cost because you're not actually paying for this, uh, the soil as well. But uh, again, involving use in the process. Next slide. And in many places, creating new tree pits 
where they formerly didn't exist. This is a really important part of the work because many of the neighborhoods that we're working in never had trees in the first place. They are just seas of ocean, uh, oceans of asphalt and concrete that trap he the heat from the sun in the summer and then re-radiate that at night, making life uncomfortable and potentially dangerous. So we've actually been working with some of our youth um, and our, our young adult employees to work with a, a concrete saw to actually be cutting new sidewalk pits. And this is a really important aspect of the work because we're really going on the offensive and pushing back on the urban heat island, removing heat trapping concrete slabs, and also increasing opportunities for stormwater infiltration so as to reduce the likelihood of combined sewer overflow events. Next slide. Watering is a particular challenge, right? Uh, concrete sidewalks are incredibly hot places, uh, making soil uh, very prone to drying. And these newly planted tree trees, tree trees require ideally about 20 gallons of water a week. Water is heavy. Water pay, weighs about eight pounds a gallon. So, uh, you know, a five gallon cube is 40 pounds in and of itself. So we have staff uh, and, and new staff who whose job it is, is to deliver water directly to trees. One of the tools we use for doing this are cargo electric tricycles, like the one that you see here. We also use it for compost pickup, which is why it's actually filled with uh, old pumpkins in this photo right here. But they do move water around. They have about a 700 pound payload capacity. And what they are is affordable electric vehicles that aren't producing particulate emissions, which is critically important in neighborhoods like ours, where you have asthma rates approaching 30 and 40% in a vulnerable populations. So great to be able to cut out internal combustion engines, particularly when we're experiencing extreme air quality events in the past couple of days. So these uh, vehicles are great for delivering water directly to trees and keeping them alive and thriving. They are um, legally classified as bicycles, so no um, insurance or registration. And whoever is driving them doesn't need to be licensed. So great potential for job creation as well, which is often an aspect of tree planting programs that isn't considered. Uh, next slide, please. So just in conclusion, um, challenges that we've faced in doing this work or funding, of course, we thank the DEC, particularly their Office of Urban and Community Forestry has funded the South End Biocultural Diversity Forest Program. Um, money is, is always important, not just for planting trees, but really the, the biggest cost is keeping them alive during the summer. Planting the trees is the easy, easy part. Keeping them alive is much harder. Um, nursery uh, li limitations in the tree nursery industry uh, is again geared towards the needs of municipalities and the tree species they have historically preferred to plant, which include a lot of um, non-native varieties. So we are simultaneously creating a community-based nursery where we're growing a lot of our own trees up from seed. Salt. Salt is uh, the enemy of trees. Uh, road salt that is applied during the winter months to melt ice kills a lot of trees. So trying to figure out ways that we can reduce the amount of road salt that gets applied during the winter months. Infrastructural issues. Power, power lines create a lot of problems with trees. We're trying to be smart about it now and not plant trees that are going to grow into giant trees directly underneath power lines. However, the, um, smaller trees are going to produce far less shade than mature trees. So we need to figure out some way to work around this. Watering, like I mentioned earlier, um, for us, um, the limiting factor is probably the capacity of our tricycles to move water around. And then cultural and educational, really needing to reframe the messaging around trees and be speaking about it through an explicitly climate justice focused lens. Whereas historically, most discussions about trees are about their aesthetic value and about their value in terms of increasing property values. We really need to be centering their potential to produce shade and their function as air purifiers and also for food production as well. So this work is ongoing and we really need a team of tree educators to go out there and talk about to people about their, their importance and their value. And uh, that's all we have today. So thank you so much. Scott, there was a, there was a few questions in the chat. Do we have a minute to directly answer those? That 
Well, yeah, thank you so much. Stacey. What I would love is um, if we could, I think a couple of them are maybe like sort of short yes, no type of questions. Maybe not. I might be wrong about um, permits and whatnot. Um, I'd love to kind of keep us moving. So we have time at the end for, for full questions, but if you see a question in the chat that is um, sort of straightforward uh, and you can answer, that would be excellent, um, but really appreciate. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. I, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Please. I think one that would just be easy to get out of the way is that we did work with the city forester. And so um, we had to work and pick out with him and have permits for um, the sites that were chosen. So, um, as much as we'd like to, we weren't just randomly going and ripping into concrete. <laughs> yes, all the work was permitted and all the, the trees had to be approved by the city forester. So we work very closely with the city of Albany in this project. Great. And we're really um, glad that he did support for trees, which um, was great. That's excellent. I just planted a, we just planted a pawpaw tree in the, my backyard so it's exciting to hear about what you're doing um excellent so i don't see any other quick clarifying questions um i think we're doing great on time which makes me think we're going to have a really rich discussion because i'm seeing some of the things pop in to the chat um, for the full discussion but before that we have a final speaker um and it's been really great to yeah to get the mix um some different types of uh, institutions and, 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 and actors working in this space. Um, we're going to next turn to Julie Phillip, uh, or Julie Phillip rather, um, who is the director of community engagement for the Monroe County Department of Public Health. Um, and she's been in this position for the last three years. Previously, she was a journalist and worked in television, radio, and newspapers. And much of her work has focused on the disparities um, that exist in education, health, and housing. Um, she also is an active outdoor sports aficionado and enjoys traveling, mountain biking, rock climbing, skiing, snorkeling, and hiking. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Julie. Thank you, Anna. It's very nice to be here, and and, and these have been great um, presentations. I have a little disclaimer because um, we have just started our project, so I don't know that we qualify as an outstanding model yet. Um, but we are hoping to show that even small, timely practical efforts can have a big impact on, um, on lives. So this project uh, was funded by a small grant from the New York um, State Association of County Health Officials, or NYSECHO, and also the New York State Health Department. Um, and we were basically asked to come up with a project that um, helped vulnerable populations adapt to extreme heat. Um, and so while we're going to go through the project, we don't, I don't know all of our challenges, challenges and results yet, but we are, um, I'm hoping once we get going, we'll have a better picture of that. Next slide, please. So, um, we use the New York State Department of Health heat Vulner vulnerability index um, to thought, think about who our most vulnerable residents were. So if you go in, um, New York State has a really great interactive story map that um, shows heat vulnerability by different factors, and two of them are language and socioeconomic background. So um, Rochester has historically had a um, very significant Puerto Rican population, um, but after Hurricane Maria, we saw upwards of three, four, five thousand new residents coming. Um, settling with families who already lived here, um, but they're newcomers. Um, in, they have said in census, you know, uh, surveys that they English is a, is not a language that they understand very well. Um, so we we took a look at this heat map and we looked at where um, which census tracts where language was a significant barrier, where people said they didn't speak English well, and where. Um, socioeconomic um, situation was also a, bar a, a big barrier. You know, I, I don't need to get into it because the panelists have done such a great job talking about why um, certain factors have led certain populations to be more vulnerable to all kinds of health problems due to inequity and racism and housing and all of that stuff that is connected. Um, so we weren't surprised when we found these, you know, overlapping areas of Spanish language and socioeconomic problems that made them more vulnerable. 
Um, and, and COVID in some ways had already um, brought us into these neighborhoods for very similar reasons. So we, we had started to develop some partnerships in these areas um, and we saw this as an opportunity to further develop those partnerships um, and work on this problem with them as well. Um, so that is how we ended up with um, the pro deciding that the project was going to focus on people who really don't speak English well in our community and may not be getting the information they need to deal with extreme heat. Next slide, please. And, you know, this is really timely. A lot of times we go out as a health department and give information about diabetes and how to prevent things and all of that. But this is something that these folks are going to experience this summer. Um, it, as we know that many communities across New York are expecting a lot of hot days compared to normal this summer and we are included in that. So this is a small project, but it's very timely and it's very targeted. Next slide, please. So what we decided to do was partner with continued partnerships that we had started and expand on them with some Hispanic and Spanish speaking organizations in the community. Um, so in a nutshell, um, we, we wanted to um, go in and find Spanish speaking residents and, and figure out what messages would work with them for them, what, how we present that to them, what's the best way to get the messages across to Spanish speaking or, uh, individuals. So we picked these um, organizations um, who are already either um, working with or, or living in these census tracts that we identified. We identified four census tracts that are um, highly vulnerable. Um, and what we did when working with these different groups is come up with three established um, uh, events that are already organized where we know there will be high concentrations of Spanish language speakers. Um, it includes our Puerto Rican festival. It includes um, an afternoon at La Marquita, which is a Puerto Rican marketplace that runs every Sunday in Rochester in, in these neighborhoods. And then one of the R centers we found in, that, in, in those census tracts um, has a senior program for seniors who speak Spanish as their primary language. So we're going to go in to those three events. We also have um, worked with these partners to identify places we can go for pop-up events. So we have a mobile health van um, that we plan to take out when it turns you know, 90 degrees somewhere, we're gonna pull up outside of a playground or a beach where we know there's a lot of Spanish language speakers and do pop-up events there. And then also with these partners, um, we're going to be help, have, asking them to help us distribute information and resources to the um, their constituents who are Spanish language speakers. Um, so next slide, please. In terms of what kind of resources, I don't have any Spanish language speakers on my staff. So we really had to think about, well, how are we going to educate and inform people if we can't speak Spanish. Um, we we looked in a lot of places and we found that the Centers for Disease Control has a ton of really good information for consumers and uh, almost all of it with one simple little click there at the top, you can switch it to Spanish and you can print out all of their materials in Spanish without having to get them translated. And if you wanna take bits and pieces of them, you just compare the English version with the Spanish version um, and you're able to use the Spanish language documents, even if you don't have a Spanish speaking person on your staff. Um, and so there are, there are plenty of other resources as well. Um, and we do have some money for translation, which I'll get into a little bit more. Um, but we did find that the CDC just has a really rich supply of Spanish language resources. Next slide. And then, of course, you can't just do vegetables um, for community engagement. Um, so we took a lot of the CDC resources and we boiled them down. Um, our partners said everybody loves magnets <laughs> in the Puerto Rican uh, in our in our neighborhoods there. So we made a magnet. You can put it on your fridge and remind you to to stay hydrated on hot days. We're doing water bottles. Um, the CDC have a um, coloring book in both English and Spanish for kids. So we thought that would be a really good way to, 
while we're engaging with parents and grandparents on the vegetable part, on, on the information and resources, we have crayons and coloring books for kids to keep them busy and they could take home and they can learn some things as well. So we have a lot of that kind of stuff mixed in with our, um, with our vegetables, our information about how to protect yourself in, in extreme heat. Uh, next slide. So getting to the challenges, as I said, we don't, um, you know, we, we aren't at the meat of our project yet. So I'm sure we will come up with more challenges and, and lessons learned as we go along. Um, but a couple of the initial ones that we've had since we started working on this in, in end of March, April, is um, the cost of interpretation. We do want to make sure that we have a Spanish language speaker with us at all our, our live events. Um, and that's not, that does not come cheap. So um, we managed to take some of our money. We saved on translation by using all the CDC resources that were already translated. Um, and we moved some things around a little bit so that we can make sure we can afford, um, you know, many hours of interpretive service and have a live Spanish language speaking person. We did not, um, you know, many of our partners obviously speak Spanish and we did not ask them to partner with us by giving us free interpretation. Um, we just working with them through COVID and many other health issues, you know, the demand for them to donate their interpretation services is really high and we didn't feel that was appropriate to do um, with this. So we really tried to make sure that we had the resources to handle that ourselves and not rely on free interpreters within the community. I have a feeling that will still happen. There's a lot of bilingual speakers too. And when we're out in the community, I'm sure they're gonna pitch in and there's gonna be a lot, a, a mix of it, but we really did wanna fund our own interpreters. Um, another challenge that comes with all kinds of, um, of conversations that are interpreted between speakers of different languages and ASL and all of that is that it can get a little bit hard. It takes a little bit longer um, to get your messages across. So we are trying to do a lot of visual things um, to go with the conversations that we have during our community engagement, um, but that I, we anticipate will be somewhat of a, a challenge. Finding high density locations. It's easy to go in and say, I bet, Spanish language speakers are going to come here, but we want to make sure that the audience we're targeting, the people who sat on the census, that they have trouble understanding English, that we're really touching base with them, that we come into contact with them. So we've worked really hard with our partners to figure out where there will be high density, um, you know, contact with individuals who don't speak English. And they came up with the markets and the and the festival and parks and, and certain programs at rec centers. And there are churches where the services are given in Spanish. Um, so we were able with our partners to hopefully, and we'll find out, um, really get at the target audience that we're going for. And then another one, which I, I, I think um, Erie County uh, alluded to is sometimes the solution, the infrastructure just isn't there. Um, our cooling centers similar to Erie County are not open 24 seven. They're not, um, I think we only have one that might be open 24 seven. They don't allow pets right now. And so that's an area that people have, has that's kept people from going to cooling centers. They're talking about opening a cooling center for pets, but you don't get to stay with your pets. So there's a lot of things. And then of course the lifeguard shortage is, you know, our pools and beaches aren't all going to be open. We had hoped to make a big bilingual map of here's where you can go um, to get cool. Um, and we're, we're having to step back because none of those locations have even been confirmed yet and we're, we're into June now. So that's been another big challenge, you know, in addition to staying hydrated, stay, you know, all of the tips that are on the CDC resources, we'd really hope to localize some of that. Um, and the infrastructure is still being uh, worked on uh, similar to what your accounting was saying. Um, and I think, I think that might be the end of it. It is. So, questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Julie. Um, and um, we've just to acknowledge, we've, we've just switched the functionality of, I'll come back on, sorry. We've switched the functionality of the chat because it seems the questions were just going to the panelists. So I just wanted to acknowledge that though. Um, I'm not seeing any clarifying questions for you um, at this time, Julie, but um, wanted to tell everybody that if you have questions that you can, you can put them, uh, I think you put it to everybody and then to everyone and you may, everybody will be able to see it. Um, 
Um, excellent. So I would love to um, transition us a little bit. Um, and what I think I'd like to do is go back through some of the questions that have come in through the chat um, and just clarify. I think some of them have been addressed, but you, it was like being on one side of the phone where you don't know the you don't know what the question was. You might have seen an answer, but you don't know what that what was asked, or, or it's like Jeopardy or something. Um, so I wanted to just uh, acknowledge that, and then um, want to open it up for some additional questions as well. Um, there was a question, kind of going back to the first, and maybe all the panelists, you could come back um, onto screen so we can see your faces again, if that works. Um, there was a question for Bridget around the uh, certifying organization. I think you answered that. That was for um, uh, the certifying organization for um, the, the training. To, that was a Kim yes. Bates. It's in the chat, right? Okay. But I did you, and I just wanted to make sure because we had an issue with the chat where panelists' questions are com questions to panelists are coming in to the panelists, but not everybody in the audience can see the question. And so I just uh, want to okay. make sure what I want to do is go back through a few of those to just make sure people he, uh, know what the uh, question was, so that they can connect the question and the answer just very, uh, I think it will just take a minute um, to spend a couple minutes on that. Yeah, it's the, it's the website ngicp.org, National Green Infrastructure Certification Program. Excellent. Um, and I think some of these are else are a little bit clearer. There was um, a question about is there our climate safe neighborhoods the same as climate smart communities? And Bridget answered that in the chat, so you can find that response um, there. We did share the paper. There was a question um, I wanted to, to put to everybody around what challenges do you find in collaborating with local and state governments um, on, on on their support and what would you suggest in, in having um, them collaborate you've heard a little bit through some of the presentations but if you could say a little bit more anybody wants to pick up on that and that is coming from emily mart marte or mart um in Yonkers, we have a pretty good working relationship with the city of Yonkers. Um, and there are obviously a lot of political players and um, a lot of credit to be had. So I find the easiest way is to basically give a lot of credit to the city and make sure that we're making the city look good. And that usually helps things out a little bit. Um, but certainly there are a number of challenges. Um, uh, Scott's machine there is really of interest to me because we have in red line neighborhoods in Yonkers, the sidewalks are in so many cases too narrow to even have a, a tree pit in there. And there are some concerns about, you know, people not wanting trees, the maintenance issues that fall on, on you know, inevitably the parks department for every tree that goes in, there's a maintenance. And so the capacity at the city is often a challenge that uh, we're trying to address through a wor workforce development uh, program. Um, but yeah, it really does come down to capacity and spreading the credit around for all, all the things that we do collaboratively. Thanks for that. Does anybody else want to add in? Well, this, the question was also about state and federal. Was that right? Yeah, it did include, um, it was mainly local and state. Um, state. Yeah, specifically. You know, so, so this, you know, I mean, the, 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 I don't wanna, the state has been very helpful to Erie County, the Climate Smart Communities Program in particular, and also some of the NYSERDA programs, cleaner and greener communities um, have all been super helpful and have funded and made a lot of the work we do possible. Um, I think a lot of local governments, I'm sure the state has heard this, wish there was more work around messaging, especially around the climate plan um, and, you know, and supporting, uh, you know, the facts of climate change versus some of the myths we're up against. Um, and I think that that crosses over even to the space of extreme heat where it's a little less contentious. Uh, and but, you know, overall, um, 
you know, the, I, I guess another thing that it's, it would be helpful from the state is if we had uh, more climate expertise at the at the regions. Um, you know, the, there, there, there's the Office of Climate Change, but we don't have people focused on that in, in our region, in our region at least. And so, um, and that's a big gap. Like we don't have like a, a, a local person that we can work with on these issues um, who can kind of support us at this, from a state perspective on the state level. Thanks, Josh. That's great. Um, there, I wanted to um, flag a question and I also think we have shifted the functionality. So people, if you have a question and you actually just want to voice it, if you want to, if you raise your hand, um, we have that uh, function available. So uh, if you raise your hand, um, I can also call on you. Um, but I did want to share a question that came in through the chat. Um, this is uh, switching down. Sorry, it's um, there's a somebody asked about uh, projects or studies that have been done in rural areas. And I think um, we've heard a little bit. Um, I think we, there's a little bit more of an emphasis in some of the urban uh, context, but I think. This may be things where if you may also have follow on uh, uh, ideas you could drop into this chat, but you might have thoughts on projects or studies that have focused on rural areas and particular thinking about that sort of more sparsely uh, populated communities and preparation for extreme heat events. And so I know some of, if some of you have experience in that space, if you want to um, share anything at this moment, that would be excellent. I, I can pull up the link. The grant that we got it, again, they're, they're small grants, but um, from NYSHO, they did purposely seek out a bunch of rural communities. So I know a number of our other um, grant recipients are doing uh, work in rural communities. So I'll see if I can find that. Yep, about a third of Erie County is rural, and uh, and so you know climate vulnerability in general with our rural community is is a is it something we're trying to work on? Um, and sometimes this issue really with manufactured housing, um, which is often located in floodplains and you know doesn't isn't weatherized and it has you know oftentimes just a lot of structural issues that make it vulnerable to things like extreme heat. Um, but you know we haven't. I can't say that we have a have a have a program or or have a solution to that. It's something that. That we're aware of is a is something we need to include in our program. Thanks, uh, Josh. And yeah, if you're able to Julie drop anything to the chat, additional resources that would be great. Um, there was a question for you, Scott, um, in the chat that was um, first of all a complimentary. Um, Megan Simmons was asking, "How do you navigate concerns about pollutants when?" Growing produce in urban environments, um, if that's a concern where you're located, and do you do soil mm. testing? Sure, that's definitely a concern in both urban and rural areas where there can be a variety of contaminants that end up in the food supply. In urban environments, we're particularly concerned about lead, which is a ubiquitous urban contaminant resulting from its use widely in both house paint and gasoline up until the 1970s. It is Still, blood level lead levels remain persistently high in inner city environments, frequently due to the, the lack of action on the part of negligent landlords to remediate house paint, which is often flaking and chipping to this day, and also uh, resulting from street dust. We at Radix have done fairly extensive soil testing using an XRF, an X ray fluorescence machine. I'm actually let Stacy even talk about some of the work. Uh, that she's done with uh, soil lead sampling. Do you want to mention something about that, Stace? Um, sure. We we uh, we've been involved. We have our X-ray fluorescence spectrometer that um, we were able to get with a grant from DEC, <laughs> and um, and so we've been using it. Uh, we've involved students and our youth team, and um, have offered free soil sample, uh, free soil screening for lead. To um, people in the South End neighborhood um, and Arbor Hill West Hill neighborhood in Albany, and um, we're looking to to do more of that. Also, um, we we have certainly come back with results that have been really high, and then some that are okay. 
So, um, but we've, we've been able to use it to test. We help caretake a number of gardens around the neighborhood. And so we've been able to, to test the garden areas there. And um, one garden we is, is no longer being used because of that. Um, as far as tree planting, we're a little bit less worried about that because lead, lead itself tends to accumulate more in um, the leaves and the roots of uh, plants instead of the fruit. What we really, when we think about contaminants on street trees, we're thinking about the dust that's flowing onto them. And so I'm really encouraging people to rinse and wash things that, that they would eat. Thanks, Stacy and Scott. Um, I had a question to put all of you, which is, you know, really picking up on this theme we have heard about in each of your presentations around partnerships and coalitions um, and and sort of love to have you each of you or those of you interested in elaborating more on on the role of partnerships and collaboration in, in, in making your solutions successful um, and, and how you went about building those coalitions. And then just to sort of tag on one more part to that, and you can pick up um, any one bit of this, but have you done things differently um, in thinking about um, the need for partnerships and, co and coalition that had it, had it been sort of more like your organization or your institution is sort of going forth to try to deliver on um, this, this work? What, what have you done differently um, recognizing that partnerships and coalition building has been part of um, this work? So, yeah, interested if anybody wants to elaborate on how you build coalitions and partnerships, um, what has been um, successful about that, and, and just building on some of the remarks you've made. So Bridget, could I turn to you um, to put you on the spot? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so critical. Uh, to everything we do is collaboration and partnership, particularly with this kind of work. Um, you know, I think one really strong benefit of working with across industry um, is the increase in funding opportunities that are made available. So, you know, we are well positioned to go after environmental grants, municipal housing is well positioned to go after HUD grants, the city is eligible for some. Uh, state and federal grants that nonprofits are not eligible for. So, I mean, you have across industry sectors, you're opening up doors to new funding um, sources um, that often can be difficult uh, in, in addition to being an opportunity versus like, you know, you got to kind of figure out who's the lead applicant, who's going to get what money, how's the money going to flow. Um, but overall, um, partnership has enabled us to access dollars that we would otherwise not be qualified for. And then I think the other big piece of, um, you know, we can get out as environmental people and talk to we're blue in the face about these issues, but it makes a huge difference when it's a community leader doing this versus a crazy environmentalist tree hugger doing it, right? So um, in terms of media exposure, um, I've stopped trying to like be on the news and instead when we have people that are interested uh, for uh, doing a story on what's going on in Yonkers, we will oftentimes put forward our task force members, which can then, um, to Julie's good point, reach a whole vast um, new kind of audience, right? If it's a Spanish speaking audience or the um, historically black neighborhood, like these community advocates are actually way better positioned than if we were to go alone shouting our environmentalist propaganda at the world. So um, I think that it's enabled the message to get out um, in a way that is much more accessible uh, to more and different kinds of people. Thanks a lot, Bridget. Anybody else want to build on that? Yeah, I'd love to, to piggyback off that a bit. One one thing we have um, been working for years with um, a village is one of the community based organizations um, in the south end and now branching out across Albany. And um, we have, have been building new um, coalitions looking forward to, to other environmental justice grants um, with other groups as well. Uh, one one thing that um, I, I think that that is incredibly important, and and 
the other thing, like the, the community advocacy groups, particularly smaller groups, um, and and uh, oftentimes BIPOC led working in in neighborhoods, is a lack of funding and an expectation that whatever group it is coming in, um, you know, th like help us get our message out, right? And and that it's really really important. Um, to have funding attached to that. And so, um, like we've seen it just with, we, we have um, di different agencies or whatever that, and it's, everyone is doing good work, right? But, but that it's really important that um, these smaller groups are, are funded adequately. And there's, there's, you know, it's hard. Um, no one's funded adequately <laughs> in this work. But, um, but that the people on the ground um, are. And so, like, when you had your workshop, um, Bridget, that, that all the community members that were at the workshop were compensated for their time for being in that workshop and for the contributions that they made to make the entire thing more valid. And I, I think things like that are, as we're building out projects and thinking about that, and, and or if you know, you, if you're on this call or hearing this and you have access to building funding mechanisms or whatever it happens to be that that's included in there. Thanks, Stacey. Josh, I'm curious for if you have any thoughts on this, given you, when you talk the, the impressive amount of work you, you, you have led and um, I think you mentioned you didn't have any consultants kind of involved and, you know, how, that takes a, that's a lot to, um, Harness, I guess, and if you could just say a few words about um, partnerships and coalitions. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the it's the thing that makes it happen, right? Like this, this really is, this really is, it is community work, and we can't we can't do it in isolation, and without folks like you know, without advocates and environmentalists, we can't. Um, we don't have the polit political position. Our leaders aren't going to lead on this if if those people aren't stepping up. Well, we've what I think with, has happened with us, and I, I'm really lucky to to have leadership around me that is really savvy about this. Um, I'm not the best, you know, community organizer, and also staff who are just great at this too. But is uh, is that um, I kill that? Is that we have some long-standing relationships with some really high-functioning community-based organizations? Push Buffalo is one in particular, and so we work. We have a lot of trust with them. And there's grants where we'll sub to them, and there's grants that make more sense, and they'll sub to us. You know, they they uh, you know we're working on this community energy work, and uh, uh, one of our staff um, identified this you know NREL power renewable energy accelerator grant opportunity that they were able to go after, and then provide community uh, solar to our heap program is what it's looked like it'll happen, right? So there's like kind of the one hand washes the other thing that is just the ideal thing. But I think the I think there's a real challenge too in us getting past these usual players because they're oftentimes neighborhood based. And so there's certain neighborhoods that are really strong and have really great advocacy and organizations. And then there's, you know, Buffalo's big. We have a lot of issues and a, a lot of a lot of people and um, who, who need support. And there's other community-based organizations that are, just aren't that savvy and we don't have that trust with. And so I think that kind of making sure that we're not always going to our usual players and kind of getting past that and trying to build trust in these other parts of our community that don't know us as well is our biggest challenge. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on that. The, you know, some of our most vulnerable people are also, uh, you know, our most invisible people. Um, so, trying to figure out who's most vulnerable and who needs the most information in a way that they can use it is boots on the ground a lot of times. It's really being out in the community and taking baby steps to build trust, um, which is what we started during COVID. The first time we rolled up with our mobile van, it was white with green lettering with a logo. It kind of looked like Border Patrol was showing up. Um, and I said, well, that's probably not a good look when you're going into Spanish speaking communities and, and sure enough, you know, we went and covered it with nice photos of smiley and happy faces and it's just a much friendlier way to come in. So just thinking of little things, um, baby steps to get into these communities and not thinking of it as a run in, 
create big change and leave kind of thing. It's a process. It's a it's a slow building process. So even just identifying some of these vulnerable groups um, it is a challenge. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think each of you brought up in different ways redlining. And it's not, I guess, surprising that the folks who've been were basically just financially excluded and physically excluded historically that we still we live with those issues today in terms of who has access and um so yeah i appreciate those remarks you know um, by the way just and just to add one other thing and bridget mentioned this in her presentation but you know providing funding to individuals who are participating is you know this is a model i think that is gaining traction broadly but but it's it really is important um and I, i'm glad she spoke to that and i you know it's, it's something we've started to do some um and so that that kind of and also you know offering child care at meetings and things like that so that's part of the puzzle too and transportation is another big thing assistance with transportation yeah definitely super helpful um things that make it possible for people to step out of their already busy lives to join um, I actually have a, another another question that picking up on another thread that's come up um, and maybe going back to you, Bridget, um, around this question of funding, you mentioned um, the there's sort of new maybe practices or um, even internal policies that might be needed around sh sort of funding sharing or recognizing there's these new pots of money, big pots of money in some cases coming with, with I think, a lot of the new federal dollars opening up um and that can be great and you mentioned also there's like the flip side what have you learned or, and i welcome other folks to jump in on this too but what have you learned or what have you uh needed to sort of institute to, to help kind of create that more share sharing um you know are there specific um examples you might be able to to speak to um to, to just share that um, insight as well yeah, I mean, I, it, all of this federal funding, uh, and even with the state bond act um, and the infrastructure bill, there there are two things that I think are really spectacularly innovative about these pots of money, and that is that in both the federal funding that's coming down and the bond act, they have mandated thirty five to forty percent of all resources go to disadvantaged communities, and I. I've been in the environmental world for over 20 years, and I've never seen that before. That's a tremendous opportunity, and it's kudos to longtime environmental justice advocates that have been lobbying um, uh, the state and federal government for some time. So that's that's huge, and um, uh, the sheer volume of money that's out there right now is also something that I just have never seen before. I think one of the challenges with all of this money coming down is that it's very difficult for small nonprofits to access it. So for grant, the, the big forest service grant that I'm sure many of you applied for, 1.5 billion came down from the feds. And I think it was like a four week window to apply for this money. If you're a small environmental justice group, it's very hard to move that fast. Um, and get your plan together and get it all established. And many of us also, this on the smaller side of the equation, we don't have that kind of capacity. We don't even know where to look. Like, how is the inflation reduction money coming down the pike? And which agencies is it going to? When is the announcements coming out? Like, it's all very confusing. And if you don't have sort of in-house expertise, my worry is that those big dollars are going to go to the Audubons of the world and the Nature Conservancy of the world, which are great organizations. I spent 15 years at the Nature Conservancy, but that's a challenge for smaller EJ groups. And that is one of the sort of worrisome elements is, is how to build capacity to access this money really fast if you're a small group. And I, don't I, would, know if I that would just add a question, Anna. I well, would just I, add if you're a small local government too, you know, like the exactly, small local, yes. small local governments have the same set of issues, Bridget, that you raised up. And so, like, like, and then so, like, as a county, I think it's a role for counties to support, especially local governments, small local governments, in giving capacity so they can do that. If we can find, if the county can find the capacity to do that, that can be a role. 
Really great point, Josh. I mean, in all of the city of Yonkers, there's one grant writer. That person could never access all of the money that's out here. There's just not enough bandwidth um, or capacity. So I, I appreciate the point about smaller municipalities. Yeah, we had, a, we had a meeting actually this morning with one of our uh, philanthropic organizations about that. Like, like they're, they're trying to pivot to have more of a focus on climate resilience, which, you know, thank you finally, right? And then they're, and then they were like, what should we do? And it's like, you know, help supporting these organizations and local governments and having capacity to even go after the funding that's there. Man, that's a big piece of it. There is. I'll, I'll also say this from the perspective of the small community based organism environment uh, that focus on environmental justice work. Uh, our gardeners and our tree planters and our composters are also our grant writers. So for state <laughs> agencies, if they could somehow time the release of their grant funding so that applications come out in the winter when I have a lot more <laughs> capacity to, to, to deal with that. Um, rather than the spring and the summer, which is the busiest time of the year, I am simultaneously running numerous programs and I'll offer three grants simultaneously right now. Um, put them out in January, please, when I have a lot more time to, to deal with that. That would be great. Well, I'm sure this issue never came up for USDA before, right? Like no one's ever told them, <laughs> don't release it in the spring. <laughs> USDA, come on. Yeah, these are all great. Sorry, my, I have a dog that a moment sorry about that um yeah great points um yeah and i think that that uh some really uh would be nice if we could wave a wand too and sort of help provide some uh direction on when the when he's when the money's flowing and timelines i think these are all really great points but i think putting the spotlight too on the that capacity gap um at different scales and i would say it's probably across scales um um it, it, both within government and um Community-based organizations, nonprofits, et cetera. And, and I think that's some place where um, the state can help, right? You have clean energy communities coordinators around the state who are supporting local governments. Um, you have a new uh, climate smart communities program that has coordinators around the state. And have and I know part of that is this issue with, you know, but like making sure those folks are really up to speed and can relay out information and resources and have the FAQs. That will really help make New York State more competitive and, and make us a lot. Some of these funding sources are uncapped, the IRA in particular, because they're tax credit based and, you know, can really help set the stage for us to have a lot of wins. Yeah, and I see if, if you're tracking the chat, there's a great comment by Anila Cherian to that, to that effect. So good comment. Um, yeah, thanks for that, um, Josh. I wonder if um, we have we have to kind of move toward wrapping up um, shortly. I wonder if anybody on the panel. I'm not seeing other specific questions that have come in, but I wonder if each of if you have any has has uh, closing a quick closing thought that you feel burning and you need to say before we um, start to just wrap up. Anything you didn't get to to say. Okay. Um, well, really appreciate um, everybody taking the time uh, to, today to, to give you give us such thoughtful presentations, and it was nice to see how they connected um, with one another. Um, I wanted to um, appreciate uh, the conversation here, and I think next the next one that, that's coming up in a couple of weeks will also be great to follow. Um, we're hearing about uh, communities. Um, local governments, it's really uh, where action is uh, kind of where, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, in terms of dealing with extreme heat. And so it's been really great to have some kind of tangible experiences shared um, from different parts of the state and at different uh, stages of, of action as well. It's been nice to um, have that spectrum. So I want to appreciate um, each of each of your contributions. Um, we have the, the final. Um, of four uh, webinars coming up on June 22nd. Um, this is gonna be at the same time block from two to uh, four o'clock. Um, and it's focused on preparing for summer 2023, what individuals and local governments can do during a heat wave. Um, so as you know, we're dealing right now with smoke, um, we have, we're getting protections that this is gonna be an especially hot 
summer, um, especially as El Nino is forming. Um, so that will be a great one to tune into. Um, and it's going to feature approaches and resources to help prepare for and respond to heat waves. Um, and we're going to highlight some um, select state programs and, and resources that we can showcase um, also local solutions that communities can um, at least be aware of and maybe even try to emulate in, in preparations for um, the final uh, for coming up uh, summer. So again, um, I wanted to appreciate everybody. Um, this is being recorded. You will be able to find it or share it, share it out with folks and colleagues who haven't been able to um, join today. Um, but appreciate everybody's time today and we're going to um, wrap up. Thank you. Thanks everyone. It was a thanks, pleasure. Anna, thank you. And Anna, thanks for moderating. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you everyone. Good. And just as a reminder, this uh, meeting has been recorded and we'll, we'll, we will be posting that to the website as soon as possible. Thank you everyone. Hi. Thank you. Bye.